you tell you right here, what was your, like, his conversation with Hayden about him coming back? I mean, him trying to decide to come back or just bring him back? I mean, the importance of having him back. Yeah, it was important. I, I think um, I'm very big on trying to be very honest with players about what is best for them, and sometimes it's their time to go. I mean, obviously those guys at the very top of the draft, no question it was their time to go. I would have loved to have had Grant Taylor come back. But if they're going to give him 1.7 million when he didn't even have to throw a pitch during the season last year, it's a pretty good deal for him. You know, you have to, to look at things for each player. Um, with Hayden, it was like, look, you've played pretty well. I mean, you could make an argument that outside of Dylan, the end of the SEC schedule, the SEC tournament, the regional, the super regional, there was not a more valuable player on our team. And he's had some history with injury which maybe, and maybe made it a little bit of a checkered deal for teams. Like, what do we really have here? There's not many people that have the power that he has, or even the arm strength. You know, we saw it in game one in the Call of World Series. Um, so I, I worked hard on him. Like, of like, if you go early, meaning the top five rounds, you should go. And I believe that's what type of player that he was. If it gets past that, we need to talk about what this looks like. And um, he was great. And um, just as of a couple of weeks ago, he sent me some video of him swinging the bat and said, I'm so fired up about how this turned out. And that's the way you want him. You, know, you want him to be excited and look at this as an opportunity. So it uh, really wasn't hard. I think he feels like his best baseball at LSU was still in him. Like what we saw maybe over that six-week period, I think he'd like to put together a full season like that because he hasn't really had the opportunity to do that. Jan, you were talking about some of the guys that, you know, are here as like surprises, talking about the high school kids. Obviously where they were got where they got drafted was a huge part of that. But how many of those dudes were on the fence up until the national championship and that national title was kind of that last nudge that got them here? You know, the longer I do this, um, I think you can't undervalue the family's approach to how they value college and education. I was Incredibly surprised, like we use Cameron Johnson as an example. I was incredibly surprised because of what I had seen relative to the talent. You go back last summer, whether it was Perfect Game National or the PDP or the All American Game or pitching for Team USA or what he was doing initially in the spring at IMG Academy. But the one thing I overlooked a little bit is I mean, the multiple times that he and his family came down here. They really wanted him to go to college, and they really wanted to come to LSU and play for us and believe that that was going to be important. And I was a little bit dismissive of it, only because of what I, how I viewed the talent. So I think that is something that I pay attention to going, going forward. And, you know, a really unique story is while we were in the College World Series, some guys last year that signed pro contracts for, like, over $2 million, two of them texted me and said, I wish I would come to college. So. Hmm. Um, Coach Caleb Appleby, is there any sort of update on, on him? I know he missed all the last season. Yeah, he looks uh, healthy to throw. His body is in, in good shape. Um, Coach Yeski is going to start meeting with the pitchers today, and then we're going to start their throwing program. It's August 21st today. The first inter squad game will be October 5th. So they have a plenty of time to ramp up and, and get in shape, um, which we do that on purpose. I like doing the later fall because it gives the pitchers this time to get themselves ready, and then we get a more accurate uh, representation of where they're at. And it'll be important for him, you know, to to get on it, use this time well, and then be ready to go in the fall. With the addition of these two coaches, specifically your history with me and Terry's experience in the game for various stops. Does it open up the opportunity for you to maybe do something else, do something less? Was that part of the thought process of being Easter? <laughs> I don't know, do something less. I don't know if that's in the DNA, but uh, the familiarity, big deal. You know, I mean, I'm really proud of our staffs that we've had here just in two years. I mean, you're talking about great coaches, you know, great uh, families that made great contributions to what we were doing. Like, I love those guys. I mean, they, like, they've become some of my best friends in the world. And it's great that they got to move ahead. And that's part of what we do here. However, 
this program being in a position for long-term success is the most important thing to me. And I think uh, just a, a word or a thought that came to my head was stability. It may be understanding what we could get out of both of their skill sets. I mean, both. I mean, I think they're two of the best pitching coaches in college baseball. You know, well, Jesse's going to be the pitching coach. I think understanding how the dynamic would work in the dugout. You know what I mean? Um, our communication, you know, together relative to when you're in those battles, uh, evaluating this pitching staff as it was coming together and maybe foreseeing some of the pieces that we may have by the time we got to the first day of school, I thought he was a great coach for this pitching staff also. And his skills and what I view him as the best at will match very well with them and put them in position for success. And then with Terry, I've literally tried to hire him for like four of the last five years. And um, it was a really close decision, you know, when I brought Dan here initially between Dan, Josh, and Terry, like that was cool. <laughs> and then, you know, last year with Josh, and, and basically the only reason the decision was made uh, was because they were on the position player side of the ball. And that first year I wanted to get off to a good start. And I knew Coach Fitzgerald, Coach Fitzgerald's one of the best coaches in the country. And I, that's what we needed at that time for the program. And he deserves a lot of credit for some of the guys that we brought in that helped us just win that national championship. And then I liked where we were going with that. It was literally the same thing with Josh. And on top of that, we needed to improve behind the plate. So we got a good catching coach, a guy that could coach third base, and that could also recruit. But Terry, in those, you know, that interview process was so impressive to me. And as he mentioned too, we competed against each other, four players and on the field. It's like, okay, eventually getting this guy a part of what we're doing. And as the deal started to matriculate with Wes, um, and maybe shifting the vision and looking at, you know, other SEC programs had passed us up in terms of staffing. Like we were behind, no question about that. And so presenting that, we were able to, you know, add the position, utilize a skill set, which I think he's as good as anybody in the country and on the field. You know, one of my favorite parts of this so far is players are in the office and seeing him talk to them like, I mean, he's gonna provide tremendous value. And what I've tried to do with all these positions here is get somebody that is over for overqualified for the position. And I know that sounds strange because it's LSU. I believe we have like four or five coaches in the building that could be head coaches in Power Five School. And I think both these guys fit into that, that category. Um, I know that Gavin Gidry played shortstop this summer. Um, what are your thoughts on like how to approach him this coming um, season? Is he going to be a two-way player, or has that conversation been had? Well, he did not play summer ball. Um, just he wasn't ready to do it physically um, after you know what he contributed you know on the mound, and and basically to get that contribution on the mound for last year, and we really needed it with the injuries that we had. I mean, he had to shut down everything he was doing on a position player side. So there were no more ground balls. There was no more swinging the bat. We needed everything out of the tank in the tank of that body. So the initial phase of it was to recover. Then it was to rebuild so he will be able to withstand the challenges or the, the grind, if you will, of, of being a two-way player. And then now it'll be um, a collaborative effort of, of putting that together. I do want to give him a chance uh, to be an infielder. Um, you know, that's what we recruited him with the design to do. And the opportunity last year wasn't quite there relative to his readiness and, and what we had with a few older players on the roster. But I saw some things in the fall that I liked that he could make a positive contribution there. With that being said, it's one of the best relief pitchers in college baseball. And we're not, we're not moving off of that now at this point in time. So as Coach Eski spoke at, uh, we're going to uh, have a really good plan about how we manage all that. You won't see him probably throw competitively in the fall a ton because we feel like it's unnecessary. You will see him conditioning his body and his arm and those types of things as a pitcher. Hey, Coach, uh, right here. What, what does year two of development look like for Thatcher Hurt on the mound? This is what you expect could be a really big year for him next year. Yeah, yeah I think um, if you remove two outings last year and then you stack up his statistics, he was an All-American last year. I mean, if, if you look at it, I think 10 of the last 11 outings were you know, exactly what we needed out of him, including, you know, winning the national championship game. 
you know, getting the win in that 11 inning game against Wake Forest, throwing three shutout innings, through three good innings in, in the game against Wake Forest that we lost. It was spectacular against Oregon State in the replay. That's one of the best pitching performances I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, SEC tournament, you know, great outing against South Carolina, huge outing against Georgia. So I feel like it's more of a patterning of how we finished the season last year with him. I mean, the pitch ability is there. That's a true out pitch, obviously. I think the strike zone pressure was phenomenal at those times. I think he made great strides, um, you know, as a competitor. And, and what I mean by that is that's his best quality. But I think we had to work on, you know, as I phrased it to him, take his best quality and always make it work for him as opposed to work against him. And I think he made great strides there. I think he is super motivated. Um, He's put on about 10 or 12 pounds uh, physically. Um, he moved moved back here, you know, quickly. Only spent a couple weeks really in California, if maybe even 10 days, and got back here, got to work, and um, is on it in the way that he needs to be. So I think all he needs to be is um, himself. You know, um, and one of the skill one of the coaches lines: all you can do is all you can do, and if you're at LSU, all you can do is enough. And, and that's certainly the case for Thatcher. Hey, Coach, I uh, just want to ask you about two people that we saw a lot of maybe in fall ball last year, but maybe you had to learn a little bit. Sam Rudell um, and also Aiden Moffitt. Um, can you talk about their second Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, both had very productive summers. Um, with Zeb, um, he went to the uh, Cal Ripken League, the Bethesda Big Train. They won the championship. They won the championship, and like 10 seconds later, his coach texted me, asked me if he could have Zeb back again. And uh, what we did is, with the depth in the outfield last year, we had to had to make some decisions of, was this going to be worthwhile for him? So we decided to redshirt him from the outset, got in the weight room, he added about 20 pounds, you know, worked incredibly hard, um, and then went out and got his at-bats in the summertime. The talent is there, and, and this continually will come up throughout the fall. It's, it's one thing to have talent. It's another thing to have usable skill to help LSU win today. So Zeb needs to close the gap on that. Now you have a worker and you have a, an attitude that's willing to do those things. He's one of the players I'm very excited to see about maybe where we're at as we get into fall practice and maybe somebody that people aren't thinking about or talking about that, that could make a big contribution. And that's what last year was designed to do, put him in position to help him to do that as we move into this year. As far as Aiden, um, his, his team played all the way till last Wednesday. <laughs> Ethan Fry, Mick Paul, and Aiden were playing in the Northwoods League semifinal game last Wednesday. And uh, ESPN Plus, it was great. I flipped it on TV, and there they are. And I uh, got a chance to watch that and uh, had a really good summer. I mean, a really good summer. I think um, had a bunch of strikeouts. I think there's pieces of just getting game experience that if we can continue to get that here in the fall, leading into the season, get him touching the mound a lot. I mean, you're just talking about some uncoachable traits. I mean, the fastball could get up there. It was up to 99 last year in the fall. I think the strikes are much better. Uh, the quality of pitches, even on the misses, are much better. Makes it a lot more usable. And I think, uh, you know, I mentioned in hiring Kocheski, Aiden was a guy I had in mind. Like, they click you get to another level and you have somebody that you go like, wait a minute, why weren't you got using this guy in Omaha last year? Coach, um, Stephen Milam, if I'm pronouncing it Milam correctly, uh, LSU has had pretty good track records with infielders from New Mexico. Um, is he a guy that's maybe not talked about amongst, you know, the incoming class, but maybe is going to produce a little bit or, or just how you evaluate him coming in? I evaluate him highly. and, and to be fair, I think, you know, when I thought about the most important pieces of getting to school, uh, I had two players in my mind. He was one of the two players that I really believed that we needed to show up here uh, for. He's a, a terrific hitter. He has a lot of strength and bat speed and power and smaller frame. Uh, he has a competitive nature that if you're going to have any chance of making an immediate contribution, you have to have here. Has that. He can really defend. Um, we'll give him opportunities at both shortstop and second base. Um, I felt like he was going to be a super important player. I mentioned, you know, those draft meetings in December. I flew out there to Las Cruces, New Mexico, and met with him and his family. And to their credit, they stuck to stuck to their guns. Um, 
there's a scout I really respect, R.J. Harrison, uh, Tampa Bay Rays, uh, does done about everything for them, and they evaluate better than anybody. I mean, they took Trey and Garrett Edwards, so there you go as an example. Uh, so, and he's like, hey man, you got the you got the little man through the draft, and you just saw him at the uh, event with Terry. He's like, you're gonna be really happy about that, and. Um, and then you mentioned, you know, Mac Bingham as well. I walked over to Terry and he's like, man, you're in a good mood all of a sudden. I was like, well, somebody I respect more than anybody else, you know, in terms of evaluating players, said this, this guy's a guy. You know, so I'm excited about that. Anyone else? All right. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, coaches. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.